this war in Ukraine has got to end mm -hmm. at some point. Is it going to end when every part of eastern Ukraine has been destroyed? Or is it going to end now when the UN brings the sides together to discuss some kind of process for the future? So thank you, uh, Jeremy. I'm, I'm Peter, and it's the first uh, of uh, a new podcast uh, we are launching. And I'm very honored that uh, we have our first guest, uh, Jeremy Corbyn, so lifetime activist for peace and for social justice, uh, if I may say, and also former uh, labor leader. And so my first question is, uh, is about notebooks, because I, <laughs> I have read uh, somewhere that, that you keep notebooks uh, about stories that people are telling you and that you noted them. And I've read uh, that you have... Do you want to see one of them? You have some. I've some... got some in the next room, in um, my room there. <laughs> Well, I've been keeping notebooks, there's two of them, for many, many years. And they're a combination of issues that people bring to my attention locally. So it could be a housing issue, it could be an immigration issue, it could be a problem somebody is having over social security payments. I've got some notes in here about some tragic events that relate to various families. So whenever I'm walking around, I carry one with me. So I've got one here, which is somebody's immigration issue. I just saw this man in the street and he asked me to take up his case. So I wrote, wrote it all down and it's all here. But it's also notes of meetings, but it's also speech notes as well. So um, when I was um, speaking in Parliament at, uh, last week, mainly about um, Julian Assange, and there's my speech notes for a, a quite a long speech I made. And so I've got these notebooks I've been keeping all my life as a union organiser, as a local authority councillor, and as an MP. And they're a kind of social history of the community I'm very proud to represent because you see the different issues that people bring up. It's also my notes for speeches that I make and I've kept them all. I've got hundreds of them. When we go back to 2003 and, and the war against uh, Iraq, you, you had here in, in London a huge manifestation. I think it was uh, one million people, they say. We had a million in uh, Hyde Park and many more on the streets um, outside. It was the biggest ever demonstration in the history of this country. And this is a country that does not normally have massive demonstrations. My wife comes from Mexico, who thinks that anything under a million is not worth worrying about. <laughs> uh, but um, it was an amazing... Uh, and, and how do you explain the, the, <coughs> the success at that time? Uh, it was a long time prepared. Uh, it was... a growth of the Stop the War movement came from 2001. Well, actually, take it back a lot further. I was involved in a group called No War in the Gulf in 1990 and 1991. And the issue was voted on in Parliament and there was um, 17 MPs voted against the war in the Gulf in 1991. Only 17? Yeah. On, on how many MPs? Uh, 650. 650. We then went through that period of opposing that war in the Gulf. And then the sanctions against Iraq were devastating after that. A lot of children died, cancers, etc. Then after 9-11, we formed the Stop the War Coalition. It was formed about Afghanistan, not Iraq. We formed it uh, about a month later. And I was quite sceptical of the success we might or might not have because I, I felt there was such a mood of anger about the attack on the World Trade Center. And rightly so, it was an appalling, abominable thing to do. I'm no way <coughs> defend or condone it. We decided to form a Stop the War Coalition and <coughs> we got together, that is, Campaign for Nuclear Disarmament, various other people, and we called a meeting at Friends Meeting House and there was just crowds of people everywhere. We had five overflow meetings and a meeting outside. So I made six speeches in, the, in one evening at each of the five overflows and then one to the people who couldn't even get in the building and then to the um, main hall itself. Fantastic attendance and uh, that was over Afghanistan. 
we then organized a series of national demonstrations. We then had the Axis of Evil speech of George Bush in January 2002. And um, then at the start of these stories about weapons of mass destruction in Iraq came out and we had the whole summer 2002 build up on this. And we started mobilizing in Parliament on it, a number of us did. And interestingly, the numbers of MPs that became skeptical about it was considerable, very great, in, you know, really large numbers. And we then did public meetings all around the country against the war in Iraq. I spoke at about 200 public meetings all over the country and indeed all over Europe as well. I went to pretty well every country and I went to the USA also, twice to the USA to speak against the war. And we then decided we needed an international global demonstration. And if anything, the date was a bit early. We should have perhaps done it a couple of weeks later, but we, you, at that time, you don't know. So we, we figured if we do it then, at least we can mobilize people globally. And we did, and there were 600 simultaneous demonstrations around the world. And the London one was massive. The Reverend Jesse Jackson was the main speaker who came from the USA for it. And um, we mobilized people like we'd never done before. I then went to the USA that night and spoke in San Francisco the next day, which was also a massive demonstration. And um, we had the parliamentary vote where there was 150 Labour MPs voted against, but it wasn't quite enough. And it was the tragedy of Iraq then went on, all the killings in that war, all the civil war that followed after that. And the words I used in my own speech was that um, the invasion of Iraq will not solve any problems at all. It will create the terrorism and the wars of tomorrow. That we have seen, uh, hence. Uh, but now, if, if you look nowadays, like you say, also the truth is one of the first victims in every fog of war. And Absolutely. Like, we heard it at the same time. If you condemn, and you have to condemn, of, of course, the illegal act and the criminal act of Putin invading Ukraine. But we have uh, heard it ourselves then when you ask questions about the role of uh, NATO, etc. You were easily put in, in a pro-Putin camp. And, yeah. and then we saw it was not only in Belgium that that happened, but you, you also were at one time uh, labeled as uh, pro-Putin. Pro uh. Yeah, you're quite right. Truth is uh, truth and rationality of the victims of war all the time. Just for the record, when Putin became the Prime Minister, then President of Russia. He was holding hands with Tony Blair at the time. He was welcomed here. And during the time he was paying an official visit to Britain, there were two MPs opposing Putin for the war in Chechnya, Tony Benn and myself. Nobody else, just two of us. And um, I am not a supporter of the sort of gangster capitalism that has been brought into Russia by Yeltsin and then followed up by Putin. I've always said there has to be a negotiated relationship with Russia. It's a big country. It is an important place. It's going through very interesting social changes. I do speak to people in Russia quite a lot. I've done Zoom conferences with people in various universities in Russia. I absolutely want us to have a good relationship with the Russian people. Putin's attack on Ukraine is completely wrong at every level inhuman, brutal, violent, a lot of civilians have died and uh, he'll be investigated for war crimes. But if you, uh, in, in this discussion, because you saw already a lot of wars and in, in, in this discussion about the truth in the war, you, you also said uh, at one time, I think uh, that, uh, I'm going to quote you, that uh, often those that dissent at the time of perception of complete unity are sometimes seen to be prescient voice of the future. Yes. What, what, do, you, what do you mean uh, with that? Those that question the narrative and the norm they're given uh, are sometimes uh, abused at the time and better understood much later. Those very brave people, you know, all over Europe in 1914, who sought a working class unity against the First World War, Juarez, Keir Hardy, Rosa Luxemburg, Karl Liebknecht, all those people that um, formed that alliance against the First World War. Liebknecht and Rosa Luxemburg were assassinated. Juarez died. 
Keir Hardy died of a heart attack a year or so later. He was the leader of the Labour Party at the time in Britain. He had opposed the war, built up a huge following against the war. The war started, the flags were waved, and he was shouted down in Parliament two days later. Later on, after all the mass killings of the Western Front on both sides, who's remembered after all that? Those that bravely opposed the herd at the time in 1914, or those that uh, recruited working class men to go and die in the trenches. And so I just think we need to think a little. And also there is something about the reporting of war which I find quite worrying. I follow the reporting of the Ukraine very carefully and it's awful what is happening and my heart goes out to the people of Ukraine and what they're going through. It also goes out to young soldiers conscripted by Russia who are dying there. But it's always paraphrased as being a European war. Therefore, somehow it's different. No, it's a war in exactly the same way that the war in former Yugoslavia took place or the war in Yemen or Afghanistan or Iraq or Congo or Libya or Syria. It's not the only conflict. We've had a 70 year gap since the end of the Second World War. And we've had war after war after war, usually not in the richest countries in the world, usually fought by the richest countries in the world somewhere else. And about the refugees, I think that uh, there are a lot of people now with uh, Ukrainian uh, refugees in Europe who are uh, helping other peoples who are open to help. But on the other hand, you see the discussion among refugees. Uh, you have uh, this uh, reports about like uh, Indian students in, who were studying in Kiev that were not helped uh, at the Polish border or in Brussels even. Uh, and, and, and there are some, some kind of uh, double standards, but there is a sign of hope at the one hand and maybe the double standard. I raised some of this in, in Parliament and in other places as well. Refugees are victims of war, of human rights abuse, of social dislocation, of many, many things. And there are refugees dying trying to get across the Mediterranean to get to Lampedusa, trying to get into Greece, trying to get from Belgium or France into England and dying in the channel. And those that do arrive here, mainly from Afghanistan, but also from other places, Yemen, Eritrea, Syria, Palestine, and so on, have no right to work, have very, very limited public support in the initial process and rely an awful lot on charity. And some of them end up being refused asylum and end up undocumented migrants sleeping rough on the streets of this country. They are helped by churches, synagogues, mosques. Many of the religious community help them a great deal. Um, and they try to survive. And it's wrong, it's immoral. They're human beings, they deserve our help and our support. The Ukrainian refugees are being welcomed and there are 200,000 people who have offered their homes to Ukrainian refugees in the United Kingdom. Well done, thank you very much. The government is not, bringing very many Ukrainian refugees in, but I just think there has to be a similarity of treatment. And maybe Europe needs to reset its mentality about um, refugees from all over. And indeed, at the last Council of Europe, which I'm a member of, a number of us raised this very point um, in debates about refugees, that there has to be equality of treatment of all refugees in Europe. In Belgium, there is a saying uh, that uh, when the rich go to war, the poor die. You said also, and I'm going to quote you, it's very, very easy for a politician in any parliament in the West to get up and to say, go to war, go to war, go to war. It's always easy to vote for somebody else's children to go to war. That's right. I just remember the atmosphere in, in parliament in um, 1991 over the Gulf War, uh, over Iraq and Kuwait, and then the, obviously the Iraq War, and there's this sort of Thing, we're going to go and do it. And when there was a vote taken on bombing of Syria or not, I was against our intervention. I said we should be promoting a Geneva conference to try and bring about a ceasefire. MPs cheered when it went through, and I just looked at them and thought, Cheered literally. You are cheering, and you are actually going to be killing people by your decision this evening. You're killing people. 
by bombing. And it is very easy for politicians to get swept up in a fervor which leads them into war. The harder part is to say, hang on, there's got to be some other way of doing it. Now, I think Russia is completely wrong over Ukraine, absolutely wrong. I also think um, the UN could and should have been much more involved in trying to promote talks with Russia, trying to promote a ceasefire at the very earlier stages. Sadly, we're now we're more than a month into this war and it's got a horrible longevity about it, which looks to me like it might get worse, not better. I hope I'm wrong. I hope there is a ceasefire urgently and I hope there is some kind of security arrangement which um, brings about peace between Russia and Ukraine. In this going of things, uh, how do you look uh, about the issue uh, on sanctions, for example? Because <clears throat> nowadays uh, the, the appeal uh, f from some forces to, to, to harden even the sanctions. Uh, how do you look? The which sanctions, sanction, can there be good sanctions and wrong sanctions? How the problem with sanctions is that they, they start with the point of sanctioning the Russian oligarchs. The concern I have is that if the sanctions are applied against an entire people, then the Iraq example is surely an interesting one. We ended up impoverishing the people of Iraq. Half a million people died unnecessarily for lack of access to medicines and all the vi vital things because of, life, of the sanctions. Because of the sanctions. It didn't make any difference to, the, to Saddam Hussein or the government of Iraq. And I've got this horrible thought that um, we might end up a ruined and impoverished Ukraine and a ruined and impoverished Russia that does not necessarily take people in the direction of a left-wing socialist agenda for the future. Think of the parallel of what happened to Germany in the 1920s and 1930s when there was massive sanctions put on Germany, incredible inflation and levels of poverty, the Nazi party grew out of that. I'm worried for the future in that sense. So I think there has to be an urgent process for a ceasefire, an urgent process for reconstruction in, in the Ukraine, and yes, an investigation into war crimes, but also a reckoning with the people of Russia so you don't impoverish the people of Russia. I'm not here defending Putin. I'm here talking about ordinary people. On the consequences of, of these possible sanctions on the south of the planet, because you, you, you have also a, a, a world view, a world look, outlook from the global well, uh, planet. And, and if you see, for example, yeah. uh, lands like uh, uh, Egypt and, 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 and Sudan and, and who are importing a lot of uh, wheat and Ukraine green. and Russia are probably 30 to 50 percent of world grain exports have come from there and uh, the majority of it goes to Middle East and North Africa um, and also some to Asia as a whole and so food supplies are already being disrupted grain prices are already going up very fast now in that scenario you can imagine that Western Europe will be able to bluntly speaking outbid the economies of North Africa and the Middle East in purchasing grain for bread supplies and um, it's the poorest people in the poorest countries who are going to be suffering because of this. Look at the experience of the distribution of vaccinations, COVID. Mm -hmm. There's 60% of the world's population has had a vaccination. 85% or so of the people of Europe have had a vaccination. Go to a poorer country, say Burkina Faso, nobody. Mm -hmm. right. And so there's the levels of inequality which were demonstrated to us then are likely to get worse with the crisis of a food supply. That's why it's so urgent to get a ceasefire and so that um, the grain production can continue. And indeed, we've already missing the planting season for summer wheat in both Russia, well, certainly to some extent in Russia, but definitely in the Ukraine. Even back to, to the war a little bit, there's a discussion about uh, the role of uh, NATO in, in, in the whole conflict. Because some forces say uh, NATO has to be part of the solution of the co of the conflict, uh, but is NATO a part of the solution of how? What is your uh, view on on the role of NATO in, in in this conflict? Well, historically, and I said plenty of this at the time, uh, when the Soviet Union broke up in 1990, and the Warsaw Pact broke up, 
that should have been the time for a reduction in military alliances. NATO, for example, and I said so at the time. And there were many discussions and debates about it. NATO instead um, expanded its membership, gave itself a global role, and has continued with that global role since then. I don't think NATO of itself caused the Russian invasion, but I do think there has to be a discussion about NATO's role. Um, and even President Zelensky clearly now accepts that um, Ukraine will not become a member of NATO, and he sees the argument for um, a neutral, non-aligned Ukraine, which is what the Minsk Agreement was all about. And NATO has to engage with Russia in order to try and wind down the tensions. And I've said that many times in Parliament when I was both leader of the Labour Party before and since, that uh, the danger of a build-up of uh, Russian and NATO forces facing each other across a land border obviously can lead to danger. Exactly the same way that the build-up of um, American forces in, uh, w with Australia um, in the South China Sea is going to build up a tension with China. Tensions lead to mistakes, mistakes lead to problems, problems lead to war. But, but you said uh, all wars end with a political solution, all wars end with a dialogue. Why don't we cut out the fighting zone and go straight <laughs> into <laughs> the talking zone? So, but Absolutely. then people say, what a naive position that is, Jeremy. Uh, you are uh, playing the cards of uh, Russia, if you, you say so. Well, I understand yeah. people say that. Um, listen, everybody knows the war ends ends with a conference. The Vietnam War ended with initially a conference in Paris and then it, it grew from there. The Korean War, same. The Iraq War ended with brutality, with death, with destruction, and eventually with a ceasefire and so on. This war in Ukraine has got to end mm -hmm. at some point. Is it going to end when every part of eastern Ukraine has been destroyed or is it going to end now when the UN, which is what it's there for, brings the sides together to discuss some kind of process for the future? And it is about talking to people. It is about those relationships. And so it does mean building up a constant dialogue between warring parties. And it might be difficult. I've often been accused of saying, well, you only talk to our, you, you talk to our enemies. Well, I, first of all, I don't see everybody as an enemy. Mm -hmm. Secondly, you've got to talk to people who you might not agree with. I'm going to Colombia in next month to observe the presidential election that's going on. I'm looking forward to it. Colombia has had a war going on, drug war going on for, drug-related war going on for 20 years or more. Apparently, totally impossible position. I was in Colombia many years ago during that conflict. Cuba hosted talks between the guerrillas fighting from the mountains and the government. Hosted those talks. Very, very difficult. And who was advising them? People from Northern Ireland who'd been through the Northern Ireland That's conflict. Really. Yeah. Sinn Féin MPs went over there to Cuba to help try to reconcile and bring people together. So we're now in a position where those that were fighting against the Colombian government are now candidates in the election and now a registered political party. How many lives have been lost before we got to this situation? How many thousands of people died? How many hopes of young people were destroyed by this? In a way, what, I, what you are doing and what, what you are saying in the campaign you're waging is also to, to, to let hear that voice because the main voice you hear is you cannot talk uh, with Putin, you cannot talk uh, with him, it's not possible to, to, to have an agreement. And this voice of peace at this moment, at this stage, in, in, in European perspective is... I'll quote Richard Nixon. Of all people, Richard Nixon, 1972, went to China. Went to China. Nobody thought it would ever happen that China and the USA would settle down together. It is possible. It is possible to break log jams if you're bold enough to do it. In the United States, uh, the economy is going to profit from this whole war situation. And if you see, for example, the energy questions, 
and the new contracts that uh, are being made uh, with the United States. How, how do you look on this relation about Europe and, and, and the United States? In well, the USA did very well out of World War I and World War II, and most subsequently it has not had its economy affected in the same way as the rest of the world does. They've not been directly involved in the sense of um, land fighting in the, in the USA. We now have a situation where Europe has an energy crisis, particularly Germany, but other countries to a lesser extent because of the amount of gas and oil that's come from Russia. The only way around that is either import gas and oil from somewhere else, and so the oil prices have gone up a great deal and so have the gas prices, or switch over to some other source of uh, production. Well, I'm in favor of sustainable production. I'm in favor of um, geothermal, sunlight, um, wind power and all that, absolutely. But you can't do it all in one year. It takes several years to do it. And so Germany is now in a situation where it's going to be running out of gas. It'll start off by running out of gas in industry and then moving on to domestic consumers. And so it does show the need for us to accept that there's an interdependence of the world. Or we might be moving into a completely new phase where Russia, India and China, three of the world's biggest economies, become closer together and Europe becomes more and more excluded from them. And it, the world is going to look very, very different um, in next year and five years and ten years' time than what it does now. And so the importance of stopping this war mm -hmm. because of the cascade effect on poverty, not just in Europe and uh, in Russia, but also in many other parts of the world. There is a um, interesting phenomenon that's growing, and that is the assertion of alliances of um, southern countries who are trying to assert themselves. And there's a very changed political atmosphere in both Africa and Latin America, moving away from uh, economies that depend solely on the export of raw materials to developing the internal continental market in both Africa and Latin America and the sale of finished goods rather than uh, traditionally, which they've done, is sold um, minerals or basic commodities. And so, for example, as the world transitions into more and more electric vehicles and electric powered vehicles as being cleaner than diesel or petrol powered vehicles, lithium becomes very important. There are very large reserves of lithium in uh, Bolivia, uh, Argentina and Chile uh, and in Mexico um, as well as in um, other, other places around the world, China, Australia and so on. This mineral revolution in Latin America is being handled very differently to previous ones. You think of the history of Bolivia and Peru that have dug out their silver, dug out their gold, dug out their ores of every sort and sent them away without any processing. This time it's different. They're proposing to process lithium, use it to uh, set up manufacturing capacity. The whole trend on the economies in Africa, having gone through the colonial period, gone to um, structure adjustment programs which put them into the world uh, free market economy which resulted in privatization and a great deal of poverty, are now looking at interdependent economies in Africa. So the world is beginning to look a very different place than it did five years and ten years ago when European and American supremacy was uh, much greater than it is now. You said you came back from uh, Chile and, and you also mm -hmm. said, uh, if you look with the eyes uh, from the global south, there was also signs of hope of what is happening there uh, in, in Latin America, for example. I think there's massive signs of hope. I was invited to Chile by um, the president-elect Boric, as he then was, and uh, I very happily went to witness the inauguration and um, talk to people, older Chilean people that remember the days of Salvador Allende, remember the brutality of the coup in Pinochet and uh, all the difficult years that brought in and all the deaths that brought in and also the sense of hope that was with it. The government of Boric has come into office on the basis of a great deal of hope of particularly young people and that's how he won the election. They're looking for free education, they're looking for a free health service, they're looking for decent wages and decent opportunities. Chile is the most divided 
economically country in the whole of Latin America by a long way. What do you mean uh, with divided? Uh, Between richest and poorest. The richest live very, very well in the suburbs of Santiago. Very, very well indeed. The poorest live all over them. And um, their income levels have fallen and the stress is absolutely huge on them. Boric's government has to deliver for those people. You cannot do it unless you start taxing the very richest, unless you start attacking their privileges and start moving the way in which their lifestyles have been conducted. There's going to be brutal attacks on his, him and his government of that, I'm sure. And uh, I was uh, interested to talk to people, particularly young people, who were learning the experience of what um, Salvador Allende's government went through in 1970 when they tried to bring into public ownership the key industries and the mineral resources of the country. This time I think people well understood what's going on and also this is a social media generation which um, means that people do get instant information. It might be wrong, it might be right, but it, they get it very quickly. It is a very different era to those that uh, grew up with the paper leaflets, who grew up with the internet information. And so that has to be engaged with and managed very carefully. And what I was impressed with was the way in which um, the modern approach of um, Boric and his team was totally engaged in social media. It's very important. The left can't ignore social media. Okay. I have one uh, final question for you. Yeah. Totally uh, out of topic. Uh, it was about football. Nah. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know? <laughs> because everyone knows it. Uh, it's about Arsenal, yes. And yeah, of course. Because uh, uh, football came from, from Britain to Belgium, uh, in Antwerp, etc., etc. And then Arsenal was uh, originated uh, with the workers from the... Indeed. From the gun... Uh, no, the Arsenal's origins are the munitions workers from the Royal Ordnance at uh, the Woolwich Arsenal. And they were called the, the Woolwich Arsenal because they came from um, Woolwich. And then they moved to Islington in 1913 and um, bought some land from the church and set up the club. The club, when it was founded, was very poor. It was a it was working men's club, mm. football club. And they borrowed kit red and white uh, shirts mm. from Nottingham Forest who were then a very well established and famous club and so the first Arsenal kit was from Nottingham Forest which is why Arsenal still play in red and white and um, now there's nothing logical about football and I hate the money involved and I hate the sort of um, all of that and the fact that many owners don't really give too much interest in the club but the principle of football and bringing people together I'm with um, Albert Camus and others on this, Camus, on understanding of football. I'm with Eric Cantona on this, I'm with Thierry Henry on this, the beauty of football. And seeing young people getting together, playing football, they understand teamwork, they understand each other, they understand supporting each other, and they, they understand the need to be healthy and to be fit. What's there not to like about that? And so, um, yes, I do support Arsenal and I'm a great admirer of Arsene Wenger, our former manager, who I think made a fantastic contribution and still makes a fantastic contribution to football the world over. So the, the, the spirit of cooperation uh, in foot, even big money but cannot break a, it. Wenger was such a nice guy. He was awarded the freedom of the borough of Islington and um, I wrote to him to say, um, I'm really sorry, I can't be there because I'm going to Angola on a delegation and we're looking at the issue of clearing landmines and uh, support for the future of Angola. But I'm really sorry, but I wish you well. And I'm so pleased you were made this award by our, uh, our community. And he wrote back and he said, Dear Jeremy, thanks for your letter. You're doing something useful, which is more than I am. Which is nonsense, but what a nice man. Okay, gentlemen. Jeremy, thank you very much for... Thank you, thank you very much, it's been fascinating. Enjoy talking to you. <laughs> Enjoy talking to you. Yeah.